Hello everybody, welcome along. My name is Benjamin Bloom. This is the Benjamin Bloom Football Channel. Please leave your bias at the door and join us for our first playoff semi-final second leg preview. We are talking about Brentford versus Bournemouth, the first game on Saturday and Bournemouth will be carrying a one goal advantage going into this one. We're going to have a look at the whys and the wherefores as we preview this huge game on Saturday. As you can see, we are partnered with Football 365 and Betfair for these preview shows. You can check out my full written preview of this over on Football 365 and go and give them a follow on Twitter. And of course, we will be carrying some interesting, thought-provoking odds from our friends at Betfair um, throughout this show. So, it's all eyes on Brentford versus Bournemouth Saturday at 12.30. Third versus sixth, with sixth place having that one goal advantage. And you can join us for a pretty epic day of streaming. I'm going to be in this chair from about 12.30 to about 8 o'clock at night, I think. We've got three games on Saturday, and this is the first. And it is beautifully poised. There were the first leg lineups, and we can learn a fair amount. We'll go on to try and figure out what teams are going to be used. But you can see Bournemouth, we knew in that first leg we're going to go with that 4-2-3-1 couple of issues with Steve Cook going out injured and Ben Pearson also. I don't suspect we'll be seeing Junior Stanislas back. So we may be somewhere close to this next time around. But the danger in that front for Dan Juma, Billing, Brooks and Solanke. And that's the system that won the seven on the truck, wasn't it? And despite the three defeats towards the end of the season, that is the system that got the victory on the counter-attack with that goal from Dan Juma in the second half on Monday. Brentford's a little bit more up in the air. They went with the three at the back, the 3-5-2, 5-3-2, whatever you want to call it, is fine by me. Norgaard dropped in between the centre-backs. Um, a young right wing-back and an attacking midfielder playing at left wing-back. And interestingly as well, Jensen and Fosu, we would normally expect the sort of midfield triangle with Fosu in the 10 position. It was as described there though, with Jensen trying to get out to cover one side, uh, particularly to help Ruslev uh, right back against Dan Juma, and Fosu getting out the other side, attacking fullbacks at Bournemouth. Brentford a little bit more... Um, risk averse than they would be perhaps in a normal regular season game but this is knockout football in its understanding Tony and Force started up front some interesting names on the bench and let's look at the players who did get on Wilshere, Stacey and Mepham uh, Mepham and Wilshere was obviously um, no options there because of the injuries to Cook and Pearson and Stacey used just to shore up the right-hand side as the game ticked out. For Brentford, Mbuemo, Marcondes, Godos, a bit of attacking impact and impetus brought into the game, and Dalsgaard and Henry. And we'll talk a lot more about them in a hot minute. So that was the first leg lineups, And it is advantage Bournemouth, but... If we look at those underlying numbers, it was a job well done by Bournemouth because looking at the shot map there and the XG on the right, 1.87 to Brentford and they didn't get on the score sheet. That big, glaring, huge circle was Brian and Buemo's pretty much open goal in the second half. Will they be made to pay for that mischance? I wonder. Looking at the numbers during the game, four shots on target to Bournemouth to one for Brentford. That's the telling stat. Um, Bournemouth used their efforts a little bit better. Yes, Billing did blaze over, didn't he? But Solanke hit the post. Uh, Dan Juma obviously getting on the score sheet. Cook testing Begovic as well. 
um, with a header. Three big chances to two, though, in Brentford's favour. does say that Bournemouth have played this one well, but it does also say that Brentford didn't take their chances when Bournemouth perhaps did. There's a very simple equation from Betfair. A Bournemouth clean sheet, we now know, means that they will be in the final at Wembley. 16-5 to for a Bournemouth clean sheet over at Betfair. If they can do it, replicate what they did and shut Brentford out, they're in the final. Here is that Bournemouth team and we'll have a little think about what they're going to do going forward. So, look, Cook, we're not sure. We don't know. Um, it's, it's a knee, I think. It's obviously a quick turnaround, Monday to Saturday. We probably won't really know for definite. I, I can't see what they're gaining telling us he's not going to be there, even if he is not going to be there. So I'm sure we'll get radio silence or cryptic messages out of Bournemouth, unless they want to be very, very transparent. Why would they? It would just advantage their opponents. So if there's no cook, it's going to be Chris Meppham, former Brentford centre-back in there. With Pearson, I think it's a bit more likely that he is going to be there. Obviously, there's no Lewis Cook. So it's an interesting one because... You would be going in there with possibly, looking at that bench, Jack Wilshere as the main option. Is he ready to start? This game could go to extra time. He's definitely not going to play 120 minutes, is he, Wilshere? So that would be an interesting one if Pearson's not 100%. And like we said earlier, unless Stanislas is fit, I don't really foresee any changes in there at all in that starting lineup. For Bournemouth, so it's all just fitness questions. Whereas when it comes to Brentford, well, we are really, really up in the air with this because Henry and Dalsgaard returning means we could possibly see Brentford and Thomas Frank switch back to the 4-3-3. Now, this would be pretty big news because as the season ran down and Brentford's form tailed off a little bit, it was that big switch from 4-3-3 to the 3-5-2. Now, if this switch was mainly predicated on those fullbacks, Dalsgaard and Henry, not being fit, and Henry missed the last 16 games of the season, my goodness, Dalsgaard missed the last nine, if it's about those two players, then he might switch back, and it might be the 4-3-3, which would then bring Brian and Buemo likely back into the starting lineup. Christian Norgard back into midfield. Although there's an interesting question. Would you keep Christian Norgard in central defence? I mean, it's so, so up in the air. And again, it's fitness, isn't it? Are Henry and Dalsgard ready? And remember, it could go 120 minutes. So even if they are ready, are they going to finish the game 120 minutes? Is it more sensible to drop them in during the game, especially if it could go. If they go a goal behind Brentford, will they get them straight on the pitch? I don't know. It's a real interesting one for Thomas Frank. I wouldn't be surprised if those lineups drop an hour before kickoff, 11.30 on Saturday, and it is Henry, Dalsgaard, then Pinnock and Janssen, Norgard back into midfield with possibly Jensen and Janelt, but Marcondes an option there. It would mean Marcus Force missing out. Tony up the top there and Buemo back in his preferred position, perhaps as a starter. And then you're between Canos and Fosu, maybe Force, probably not as a wide forward. Or he could go unchanged. And if Dalsgaard and Henry aren't ready to go, then maybe we get a very similar starting lineup with those two wingbacks, Canos and Ruslev. But um, he could even bring Dalsgaard and Henry in and it'd still be a 3-5-2. Who knows? Who knows? I thought it was very revealing though. Brentford finished the game with a back four and Dalsgaard and Henry on the pitch. How fit are they? Only the Brentford medical staff know that, don't they? And we're not going to find out until Saturday for sure. Uh, my Bournemouth one to watch is David Brooks. Obviously, all eyes on Dan Juma and really parlaying into that conversation 
um, that we can have about team selection, there was a sense that the three at the back is maybe a little bit better set up to stop Brooks and Dan Juma down the sides. You can get a central midfielder across, a high wing back and a right or left sided centre back working as a three down the side. You can really cut the threat of Dan Juma and Brooks off at source. Now Dan Juma gets a lot of attention, therefore Brooks may have space on the other side. And if Brentford do go with a back four and Dan Juma is at it down the other side, Brooks may be the actual one to watch. And if they can get the play switched out to him, he is a danger. Um, inside right, he can get in there on that left foot as well. And two moments of quality in that game. You can see the assist uh, there in the first half. It was Brooks who split open the Brentford defence with that pass through to Adam Smith and Phil Billing missed the big chance. Bit of quality, comes short, feeds it through. That's what he can do. And brilliant for the goal, Brooks. As the counter-attack happens, Solanke plays in Brooks and you've got to have a really cool head to do what he did. David Brooks, everyone's charging forward. Everything's moving. Was he cool, calm, collected? Yes, he was. On the run, loads of moving parts, slides it through. And also, two Bournemouth players there and he slides it past Solanke into Dan Juma's path. He had the quality when maybe... Uh, Brian and Buemo, Christian Norgard, when that chance happened down the other end, Christian Norgard a bit too much on the cross. Brian and Buemo, poor finish. Who knows? But David Brooks, have a look out for him. He's not been at it, maybe at the level we expect from him this season. Five goals, six assists, I think. But could be a key figure if Bournemouth are going to get to the final. And David Brooks could give Brentford a mountain to climb. He's 9-1 to one to score the first goal. And, of course, Bournemouth scoring the first goal. We put them 2-0 up in the tie. 9-1 to one for David Brooks to get that first goal. Bournemouth did take the lead in the league game at the end of 2020 at Brentford. They went on to lose it, but they did take the lead. And that would mean Brentford having to come back from a two-goal deficit. 9-1, to one, David Brooks for your first goal scorer. Here's my Brentford one to watch, and lo and behold, it is Rico Henry. We had a very similar conundrum with Swansea in their first leg where we identified Connor Roberts, an attacking right back, and we said, keep an eye. And it, we're not even talking about what he does during the game. Is he fit to start, and is he going to be on the pitch? Obviously, Roberts was fit for Swansea, but Steve Cooper went with the experienced Kyle Norton and a back four system as opposed to a flying wingback like Roberts. We're going to learn a lot, aren't we? If Henry is in that starting eleven, and whether we're going to get a back four or not. Could be a canary in coal mine, telltale sign of what Thomas Frank is thinking. Henry, look at that heat map all the way up that left-hand side. Good passing stats as well. Loads of um, contributions in the opposition half as well. A big part of Brentford's attacking pattern of play dropped off when Rico Henry went out. I think it was against was it against Coventry. I'm trying to recall. Anyway, it was 16 games before the end of the season. Can they get him back in? And will he be in there in a back four? You can see from that heat map again, you don't need to play a wing back system when Rico Henry's playing. He'll do the whole side. Remember Cafu and Roberto Carlos for Brazil? Yes, I know. Um, big names to bring in uh, to make a point, but they used to do the whole side of the pitch um, back in the late 90s, early noughties, didn't they? So Rico Henry is my Brentford one to watch. Will he start and in what system? Here's my key battle. And it's not, don't worry, it's not some kind of WWE handicap match here, Ivan Tony versus three players. But again, we have... Injury questions, don't we, over Steve Cook? So the key battle for me, really, is Tony against whichever centre-back he's going to come up against. Carter Vickers, Mepham, Cook. I can't put one centre-back up there. First of all, I don't know whether Steve Cook's going to be fit. If Steve Cook is fit and Brentford play a front two, it'll be Cook against Tony. 
if Steve Cook is not fit and Chris Meppen plays and Brentford play a front two, it could be Chris Meppen versus Ivan Tony. If Steve Cook is not fit and Brentford switch to that 4-3-3, then Cameron Carter-Vickers could get involved. Now, I thought Carter-Vickers played really well in the first leg and I think there was a reason Marcus Force was quiet as well and Carter-Vickers played him very well. Ivan Tony is obviously the big reputation, big guy. He is the top scorer in the championship this season. He didn't much get the service. Um, Bournemouth played it well, didn't they? They had the screen of Pearson and Lerma in front and they made it a 1v1 battle in the centre-back position. And let's be clear, Tony didn't really get into good positions during the game and get served up. I suppose that's a bit of credit for Bournemouth for stopping it at source and remember the big chance of the game fell to Brian and Buemo, not <clears throat> excuse me, Ivan Tony. So look, there's an absolute key battle. I think Brentford are going to be a little more attacking in this game. They know the context now. They've got to win. They've got to score. Even to get it to extra time, a one goal win is what they need. So a draw is not enough. They need to be on the front foot. And your best bet if you're Brentford is to serve up your 31-goal striker, Ivan Tony. Bournemouth, if they can get it to a 1v1 battle and keep Brentford quiet enough that it's just Tony against one or other of the centre-halves will be happy. But look, the chance is going to fall. It is going to happen during the game at some point. And for those Bournemouth defenders, they've got to keep quiet the 31-goal striker. And if they don't keep him quiet, that's what Tony can do. He scored five doubles this season, two goals in a game, five times Ivan Tony. If he were to do that a sixth time, you can get five to one over at Betfair on Ivan Tony to score two or more goals in this game. If he gets those two goals, well, could still be an open game, but that is going to be big for Brentford if Tony can get on the score sheet, if he can get on there twice as well. He's done it already five times this season. Can he do it again? Five to one at Betfair for that one. Now, we often do these um, shows live, don't we, as live streams, and you can get your predictions in. I still want you to do that in the comments. There are the odds from Betfair to qualify so not to win over 90 minutes because, of course, we know Brentford could win over 90 minutes and still ultimately not qualify, depending on what happens in extra time. So to qualify, Bournemouth, obviously a favourite. So they've got a one-goal lead. Remember, those odds will change. If Brentford were to score after 30 seconds, watch those odds switch immediately. But, hey, that's the knife edge we're on. So Bournemouth, 2-1 to one on. Brentford, 6-4 to four to qualify. Don't worry about your 90-minute um, ideas and predictions. All I'm interested in now is tournament football. Get your predictions in. Who will qualify? Who's making the final? Bournemouth have that one-goal advantage. Let me know in the comments. And they are the favourites, obviously, to qualify. And here is my bet builder treble. And I have gone for both teams to score. I think Bournemouth will be on the score sheet at some point. Given what Brentford have got to do and given the quality in the Bournemouth team, will they shut them out? I'm not so sure. Over 2.5 goals. Oh, I think there's going to be plenty going on. Remember, these are 90-minute bets on the bet builder treble here. Brentford have got to go for it. That means an open game. And if it ticks on, if it's nil-nil going up to the hour mark, expect... Some players flooding forward in the last 20, 30 minutes for sure. And I've hedged my bets a little bit here, haven't I? I've gone for Brentford to win over 90 minutes as part of the treble. Again, I will reiterate, that's not the same as Brentford qualifying, isn't it? So we could, for example, get 2-1, 3-2. Any one goal victory by Brentford takes us to extra time. So I am going for both teams to score. Over 2.5 goals and Brentford to win. You're going to get just shy of 4-1 to one on that over at Betfair. 3.8-1. to one. How do you see that one panning out? It could still mean extra time. Um, my prediction? Well, I'm looking at last year. 
and I'm looking at exactly what happened, which is what happened um, on Monday as well, that Brentford lost the first leg 1-0, having finished third, and they really, really blew Swansea away in that second leg. They were two up quite quickly. Marcondes was excellent. Will he start with that in mind? Yes, did have Ben Rama and Watkins last season. I know. But they do have Tony this season and they didn't have him then. So I think Brentford will turn it around and qualify. They may need extra time. Didn't work for them in extra time in the final last season, did it? They may need extra time. They may need penalties as well. But it is set up absolutely beautifully. So I will go for Brentford to qualify. But look. They've got it all to do and Bournemouth have that goal advantage. So it's a difficult one. Get your predictions in via the comments. Thank you everybody for watching. That was my preview of Brentford versus Bournemouth. This Saturday, 12.30, we're going to be watching all three games. Do join us for all three games this Saturday. Two Championship, one League One. As I said, we're partnered not just with Betfair, but Football365. So my ideas will be in written form over on their website. Go and get involved over there. Follow them on Twitter. And this video will be embedded in there. So you can, um, well, we're in an upside down world here. If you've already read it and you know watching the video, then you'll know all of this already. But really, really happy. And a big thank you to everyone on the channel as well. I said, please welcome our new partners with open arms. And overwhelmingly, you have. And people have been very happy to welcome our new partners onto the channel, which is going to help us grow, isn't it? It's going to get us over to more eyeballs and more potential subscribers here on YouTube. With that being said, if you're new to the channel, maybe you have found us through Football365, please hit the subscribe button. Ring the bell. Tomorrow, Thursday, if you're keeping up here, we will be um, putting up the video preview for Barnsley visiting Swansea. They also have a one goal deficit to overturn. So plenty, plenty, plenty of playoff content going through the weekend. And one more time, we will be here on Saturday, live streaming, reacting, watching all three playoff games. It's going to be a long day. We're going to have a big meal beforehand. <laughs> and we are going to go for it. I can't wait. Uh, playoff showdown Saturday, maybe we'll call it. Anyway, Get your comments in on that. Um, get over to Betfair if you fancy having a bit of a flutter on the game. Please gamble responsibly, of course. And get your predictions in the comments. I've had my say, now you have yours. Thank you everybody for watching. And it's a big over and out from me. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. To see more videos from this channel, hit the subscribe button. And to be notified every time we upload, ring the bell for those notifications to come through on your device. If you really want to support the channel and me as a content creator, I will be eternally grateful if you head over to the merch store and grab something or support over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Benjamin Bloom. Thank you for your time. Go and watch another video.